All right, in preparation for the message tonight, let's take our hymnals and turn to number 140, 140, Will Jesus Find Us Watching? And let's stand to sing all the verses 140. Jesus comes to reward his servants, whether it be noon or night. Faithful to him will he find us watching, with our lamps all burning bright. Oh, can we say we are ready, brother, ready for the soul's bright home? Say, will he find you and me? Still watching, waiting, waiting when the Lord shall come. If at the dawn of the early morning he shall call us one by one, when to the Lord we restore our talents, will he answer thee, Well done? Oh, can we say we are ready? Ready for the soul's bright home. Say, will he find you and me still watching, waiting, waiting when the Lord shall come? Have we been true to the trust he left us? Do we seek to do our best? If in our hearts there is not condemns us, will we a glorious rest. Oh, can we say we are ready, brother, ready for the soul's bright home? Say, will he find you and me still watching, waiting, waiting when the Lord shall come? Blessed are those whom the Lord finds watching, in his glory they shall share. If he shall come at the dawn or midnight, will he find us watching there? Oh, can we say we are ready, brother, ready for the soul's bright home? Say, will he find you and me still watching, waiting, Waiting when the Lord shall come. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We move into an exciting adventure for Peter tonight. We are looking at learning to obey immediately. God gives commands. God expects obedience. God expects immediate obedience. He does not expect delay. God expects us to do precisely what he tells us to do, not our human version of it. God can change course and direction in human history, and we all recognize that. But sometimes we fail to realize that God can also change direction in the course of an individual life. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where it's sometimes sort of irritates us and rubs us raw is when suddenly God changes our plans or where God changes our understanding of something or where something that we've become very comfortable with and done all our lives suddenly gets slammed into reverse as we are driving down the highway at a hundred miles an hour. It throws our transmission out strips all the gears, grinds things inside the engine of the car, and makes us think that we're on our way to utter wreckage when God has just prevented us from going over the edge of a cliff. It's interesting, as we move through the book of Acts, it's a book of transition, and we have talked about that in some detail uh, as we have been moving through, and now we are going to be seeing the biggest transition of all. We're going to see a huge amount of change that begins here in Acts chapter 10, 
but it continues to have reverberations all the rest of the way through the book of Acts. We're going to have a, an entire major church council, the very first church council in Jerusalem over some of the issues that are raised here in chapter 10. It's going to be something that not only shakes Peter up as he was about to have lunch, but it's going to be something that shakes up the entire leadership in Jerusalem, something that shakes up the entire direction of the church from that point on, something that begins to demonstrate very clearly that Israel is not the church and that there are going to be distinctions between the Old Testament national Israel and the church of the New Testament. God is making some changes and he starts with something so basic as the food we eat. Now we've already learned four principles related to obedience in verses 5 through 8 when I preached the message Gentile Obedience some weeks ago. Of course we were interspersed with um, Mother's Day and the Missions Conference so it's been like every other week and we have Father's Day coming up and we've got Memorial Day coming up and possibly other travels for me coming up and so I'm not sure how much you remember of what we covered at that point. So I'm going to give a little review, a tiny review of the two sessions ago in Acts, which was I think five weeks ago, and then the session in Acts that we had last, because it's necessary for us to understand our freedom in Christ. It's necessary to understand why we are not under the law but we are now under grace. Oh, there are parallel principles. There are things that are repeated from the Old Testament in the New Testament, though on a new basis, no longer on the basis of the covenant at Mount Sinai, but now on the basis of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And dear people, it is very essential that you understand the different foundations. Why you do what you do is not based on what happened when the mountain trembled and smoked and people were afraid they were going to die. And they put a big fence around the mountain and even if an animal went across it, it was be stoned or thrust through with a dart. That is not the basis for why we do what we do today. We have a much more powerful foundation and a much more powerful empowerment and motivation. Love always motivates you to do more than the law ever required. We're about to come to the point where that door is being opened and we suddenly see the glorious grace of God extended to the rejects of the world. That's you and me. Acts 10 cannot be overlooked. It cannot be ignored. It cannot be treated lightly because Acts 10 is why we are here tonight and why we have access through the blood of Jesus to forgiveness of sins. It all started here, but let me just mention quickly the four principles that relate to obedience which we already learned. And we're going to see how God used this Gentile Cornelius, who had never met Jesus, to teach Peter, who had walked with Jesus for three years, what obedience means. Remember those four principles? that Cornelius had exhibited, number one, when you're getting a command, make sure you hear the entire message before you act, because details are important. When you leave out details, it may result, and usually does result, in disobedience. God gives us details in his word, not just vague, general, big ideas, so that we have to insert our own ideas and our own humanistic reasoning. Even when God gives general directions, it includes details. 
Sometimes God gives directions in stages. Sometimes God gives partial directions and wait for obedience before he gives you the rest of the directions. But even his partial directions include details. So be a detail man. Cornelius was a detail man. Be a detail man in learning the word of God and you'll never go wrong. Every specific word of inspiration is essential for a specific reason. God is not verbose. God doesn't just chatter because there must be something going on to fill the dead silence. Many of us are like that. You've been around people like that. They never seem to stop talking. You can't get a word in edgewise because they never seem to stop talking. In fact, they never seem to take a breath. They keep right on going. And all the time, you can't, you can't do anything but just yeah, mm -hmm, nod. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm, nod. And it's just impossible to talk to people like that. God is not like that. Every word of God is pure. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away, Jesus said. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass than for one tittle of the law to fail. Every word that God gives to us is for a precise reason, and we need to learn to listen to the details. The word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. And so we saw Cornelius was a detail man. He received detailed instructions and he obeyed those precise details. We'll not go over all those details, but he obeyed every one of the details in the text, as we saw. Principle number two was immediate obedience is proof of faith. Now we're going to talk tonight about learning to obey immediately. That was the second principle that Cornelius exhibited, was immediate obedience is proof of faith. We saw that illustrated by another centurion in the Gospels in Matthew chapter 8, where the centurion talks about how Jesus doesn't have to come to his home to heal the servant because all he has to do is speak a word. The centurion says, I understand this principle. You know, I tell somebody to do it, he does it. I say, somebody come here and he comes. He say, but somebody else go and he goes. You know, just speak the word. And Jesus, how did he respond? He said, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. Immediate obedience, as soon as you understand what God wants you to do, and that is given to you in his word, you don't have to make it up, you obey immediately. Principle number three was immediate obedience is proof of submission to authority. We live in a rebel culture. Nobody wants to do what they're told. Starts all the way with little children and their parents act like wimps and they never discipline the kids. And so the kids grow up to expect that their way is the only way. And they're startled and shocked when they suddenly run into a boss who says, my way or the highway. Dear people, immediate obedience is proof of submission to authority. God is the one who ordained authority. He ordained it in the sphere of the home. He ordained it in the sphere of employment. He ordained it in the sphere of the church. And he ordained it in the sphere of government. God established authority. Those are each intermediate authorities with his divine authority. But they are authorities where we need to learn that immediate Obedience is proof of submission to authority. Now sometimes, as we have discussed in great detail in Acts chapters 4 and 5, an authority that is an intermediate authority will give you a command that is directly contrary to a specific command of God. If that intermediate authority gives you a command or a prohibition, that is specifically commanded or prohibited in the word of God, you obey the higher authority. You don't rebel against the intermediate authority. You obey the higher authority. Years ago, when I was serving as an associate pastor in San Antonio, Texas, I had a young woman who came to the church, and her husband was in the military up at Fort, uh, Fort Hood in Colleen, Texas. And uh, she was in distress because she believed that the Bible told her to obey the one in authority over her, and she tried to be an obedient and submissive wife. 
But her husband wanted to make some extra money and wanted to rent her out to other men in his unit. And she ran away not knowing what to do. And her husband had hit her with the verses, Wives, obey your husbands. Dear friends, I think we understand that when someone gives us a command that is directly contrary to the word of God, it's not a matter of rebelling against that one who is in an intermediate stage of authority, but obeying the highest authority who has given us the command of what we must do or what we are prohibited from doing. Immediate obedience is proof of submission to authority in that context. And we studied much about that when we were going through Acts chapters 4 and 5. Now you recall as you get to the end of Acts chapter 5, and here's a very important principle for us tonight in our study of obeying authority. We get to Acts chapter 5 and we find Peter and John are brought to the council and the high priest asks them, saying, Did we not straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. In other words, trying to wipe their hands of all guilt for crying out, His blood be upon us and upon our children. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The apostles understood that principle very clearly. You obey men whom God has put in authority, and Jesus even said that too when he was talking to his disciples. He said, you know, uh, they tell you to do these things and they sit in Moses' seat, so you do those things because that's required. But when there comes a conflict between what God has said and what man has said, you must obey God. Now, it's not a matter of obeying your feelings. It's not how you feel about something. And it's not a matter of standing up for your rights. It's not a matter of, well, they've hurt my pride. Dear people, wipe all that stuff away. It's a matter of being able to precisely point to a text of Scripture that says, that command would cause me to violate this command of God. That command to do something would cause me to violate this prohibition that God has given. Too often we confuse what we like with what God has said. But now listen to the rest of this. We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins, and we are his witnesses of these things. You remember, they had gotten a commission. What was the last thing Jesus said unto them before he went into heaven? He told them that you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Where are they? Jerusalem and in Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And here is a group of men who have told them, you cannot witness about Jesus in Jerusalem. Is there a conflict? I think there's a conflict. Because the, the high priest has just reminded them, we straightly commanded you that you should not teach in this name. And behold, you filled Jerusalem. There's no question that this is a conflict of commands that's going on here. We are witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them. Pay attention to those last three words. It does not say whom God hath given to them that believe on Jesus, to them who have a warm, fuzzy feeling, to them who go down at an altar call, to them who have their theology straight in their heads and they can categorize it. What does it say? And so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. 
You see, the proof of genuine faith is obedience. And what Peter is saying here is the proof that you have the indwelling Holy Spirit is obedience. How many people call themselves Christians? How many people know lots of good theology? Perhaps even have read all of Calvin and Luther and Zwingli and all the other reformers and have read all of Charles Haddon Spurgeon and read all these great men and they know all this stuff in their head but they don't obey the word of God. You know, the Holy Spirit is given to everyone who truly believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus takes you as you are, but he doesn't leave you as you are. The Holy Spirit begins to work in your life and transform you and give you courage to witness and give you courage to obey. Now look at the next verse. Because this tells us something about obedience. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. When you choose to obey the word of God, it is a costly decision. Obedience is costly. Obedience may bring you into danger. Obedience may mean that you have to pay a price. Obedience suddenly distinguishes you from everybody else who is around you. You will be surrounded by enemies who are viciously aware of your presence suddenly. As we saw in the message this morning, thou preparest a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. And so you need to ask yourself a very serious question. Are you willing to pay the price of obedience to the highest authority, regardless of what men can do unto you? Jesus said, fear not those that can destroy the body, but fear him rather that can cast both soul and body into hell. It's not the devil, that's God. The devil can't cast you into hell, he's on his way there himself. Don't be afraid of people who can kill you. You see, there are some folks here that wanted to kill the apostles. In fact, they were plotting how could they do it and get away with it. Rather be afraid of the one who can cast both body and soul into hell. You stand before a living God, dear friends. There is a God in heaven who watches everything you do, everything you say, every time you obey and every time you disobey. Every time you walk by faith and every time you choose to walk in the flesh. Obedience is costly. Obeying what God has told us to do might cost you friendships. Obeying what God told you to do and doing it immediately might cost you some family relationships. Obeying immediately and not delaying it might cost you a job. In some contexts, if you're in a Muslim society, for example, or a, a radical Hindu society, Immediate obedience might cost you your life. Immediate obedience. Obedience is costly. Are you willing to pay the price of obedience to the highest authority? Remember, sometimes we hesitate. Do you hesitate? If you do, remember this. Obedience may be costly and dangerous, but disobedience is always costly 
and dangerous. We just don't happen to be aware of it at the time. And that's what brought us to principle number four, and as you can see, I've expanded quite a bit on what we had studied before because of the sermon tonight, but principle number four was genuine faith requires. Genuine faith requires and is always manifested by obedience, not just head knowledge. Paul writes in Romans 1.5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith, not merely believing it in our heads, but allowing it to change our lives. And only the Holy Spirit can do that. And if you have trusted Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells in you, and either you are resisting the Spirit, or you are quenching the Spirit, if it does not show up in your life. For obedience to the faith among all nations, this was not just Jewish, for his name. And so that's what we see with Cornelius. That was Cornelius. And so we saw last week the stage was set for Peter because God had planned another intersection of lives that would change the history of the world. You think about it. How little the Australian Aborigines knew that an encounter between a Jew and some Romans would change the lives of their descendants centuries later because they were also Gentiles. How little the barbaric, fiercely tattooed Picts in the wilds of the British Isles knew that a fisherman and a centurion would transform their pagan realm into the land from which would go forth an international proclamation of the gospel. There they were, as they drew nigh to the city. Those Gentile messengers from Cornelius. And Peter goes up on the roof to pray, and while he's there, he gets hungry and falls into a trance. Sometimes when we pray, we get different results than we were expecting. Peter was doing the right thing. Peter wasn't wasting his time while they were fixing the meal. He wasn't busy watching the football game on television. He wasn't busy playing um, tic-tac-toe with, you know, one of the other bored gentlemen sitting downstairs. Peter had gone up to pray. Sometimes when we pray, God changes our lives. You've heard the old saying, prayer changes things. We always think in terms of outside things. Oh, we're praying that so-and-so out there will get saved. We're praying that the government won't do this. Or we're praying that Collingswood will have a revival. Or we're praying for this. Sometimes prayer changes things that relate to us. Those were things we didn't want changed. Those were things where we felt very, very, very comfortable. Those were things whereby we thought we were already in line with God's wonderful plan for our lives. Peter went up to pray. And God showed him, as you know, that there was nothing unclean that he couldn't eat. Throughout history, God changed, we saw last week, the eating habits of men to teach them lessons. Now, most of us can easily live with the first few changes. It's only the last change from law to grace that some people, even under grace, find hard to accept. Before the flood, people were vegetarians. We saw that in Genesis 1, 29 and 30. God gave them every herb-bearing seed and green thing to eat. Then God prepared man for a long-range change in diet. He didn't make the change just yet, but he divided the animals into clean and unclean animals before the flood in Genesis 7. Then God made an intermediary change in man's diet after the flood by adding meat. And God said to Noah and his sons, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. Then God made another dietary change, as we saw, when he brought Israel out of Egypt and made Israel into a nation. It was only a national change. It didn't apply to everybody else. It applied to one nation. It applied to the nation of Israel. Now, they already knew the difference between clean and unclean animals from the distinctions that God had given to Noah. Now, God told them that they could only eat clean animals. 
That was no doubt a difficult restriction for many of them to follow because they'd been eating along with the Egyptians. But God was teaching them a lesson. Some of them had doubt. I think they probably loved some of the Egyptian food. And you know, God let that nation of Israel live for nearly 1,500 years with the restrictions just to make sure that those dietary restrictions were totally ingrained in them. You think, well, I can understand how God would change something that's just sort of a temporary thing. You know, it's a, you know we're, well, we're going to just do this for a little while. We're making a transition here kind of thing. But something that he had ingrained for nearly 1,500 years in an entire nation, an entire populace, an entire culture, and God himself is the one who gave the laws. And we saw last week in Leviticus chapter 11 in the book of Deuteronomy that that was quite detailed stuff. He ingrained it in them. And then Jesus came. And, and Jesus observed the law. He kept the precise details. He obeyed God in every particular, including the dietary restrictions. Peter grew up as an observant Jew. Peter walked with Jesus and saw how Jesus ate and how Jesus kept the Passover and how he kept the holy day of atonement. You see, Jesus obeyed the law in every particular. Peter felt comfortable with that. Peter feared having a dirty mouth. Peter followed the strict dietary laws. I hope you can sympathize or at least empathize with Peter. When he faces this conflict, I believe it was C.S. Lewis who in the book The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, speaking of Aslan, who is in that symbolic representation of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says, uh, I think it's one of the children asks, the Bavensi children asks, uh, is Aslan safe? <laughs> and the response is, no, Aslan is not a safe lion. We want everything to be safe. We want it to be comfortable. We want it to be like it always was before. We don't want any change in our lives. Dear people, do you have a sneaking suspicion down deep that there may be something in your life that God wants you to change? Here, Peter was following strict dietary laws. And you know, those are major portions of Scripture. Both Deuteronomy 11 is a long chapter. De uh, excuse me, Deuteronomy 14 is a long chapter. Leviticus chapter 11 is a long chapter. Major portions of detailed Scripture. We saw detailed men in our passage. Cornelius was a detailed man when it came to military orders. Peter was a detailed man when it came to obeying the precise minutia of the dietary laws. Both of them had learned obedience. They hadn't learned flexibility in relation to obedience when it came to Peter's case. Peter was even willing to argue with the resurrected Christ. Remember, he said in this context, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that was common or unclean. Our deeply ingrained habits are hard to change. Even when we come face to face with the direct teaching of Scripture concerning this age in which we live. God was about to teach Peter that he was going to make some even more earth-shattering changes than the picky dietary laws. That was just the crack in the door. For Peter, that was a huge change. But God starts with us gently. Now, it may not seem to Peter, and perhaps as we look back at it and think of what Peter is going through, it may not seem like such a big thing. But for Peter, it was a big thing. But for God, it was a little thing. God was going to make some changes that were so earth-shattering and so far beyond the issue of the dietary law that it was going to rattle Peter's teeth. But God started him with a little thing. 
God started him with a small principle so that he would begin to understand what God was going to do on something that was totally abhorrent to any Jew who loved the God of the Old Testament. God was going to put Gentiles on the same level as Jews in their relationship with God. God was not going to require his followers to worship him only on Saturday or face the death penalty. God was going to change from having a chosen people in only one nation to drawing a chosen people out of every nation. God was going to change the place of access to him from Jerusalem to the uttermost part of the earth. God was going to abolish the sacrificial system. God was going to change the place of his residence from a building of stone to the bodies of men and women. The dietary laws had to go because they symbolized the old order of things. The Sabbath and all the special Sabbaths, those high holy days, had to go because the Sabbath commands were part of the covenant between God and national Israel made at Sinai that made Israel distinct from all of the other nations of the earth. In fact, the Sabbath was the capstone of the law and the very final thing that God emphasized at Mount Sinai in Exodus when he gave the law. The Sabbath was to remind the Jews of the change that had occurred when God delivered them from Egypt and formed them into a nation. The Jews had indeed made it central. We see the Sabbath conflicts all the way through the Gospels with the Jewish leaders and our Lord Jesus Christ. But you know, in many ways, they were more concerned about the dietary laws. It was a special sign of a covenant God made with national Israel. Of all the Ten Commandments, that was the one that God pulls out and says, this is going to be the sign of my covenant with you as a nation. Let me just read you a couple of passages. This is Deuteronomy 5. This is the second statement of the law. We find the first statement in Exodus chapter 20, and then we find the entire law restated again in Deuteronomy chapter 5. I'll read the portion dealing with the Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day, not the first day, the seventh day, not the sixth day, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. It wasn't a matter of you shall show up and worship on the Sabbath. It was you shall not work on the Sabbath. It had nothing to do with their worship. It didn't say go to the synagogue. It didn't say go to the temple in Jerusalem. They only had to do that, the males 20 and older, three times a year. It was a matter of not working. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle. You see, somebody might have thought of a, a really a sweet way of uh, mechanizing their cattle by, you know, very late on Friday evening before the first star came out, they would uh, hook up the ox and put a bag of food in its mouth and pour the corn in so that the ox would walk all day on the Sabbath and uh, do their grinding for them and have some kind of a mechanism that when all of that fell out that something would trip, you know, like those old Rube Goldberg cartoons, trip a lever and uh, spill a bunch more grain in there and the ox would keep on walking around and keep on walking around and so they could get a lot of work done on the Sabbath even though they were, hey, technically obeying the law by sitting in their houses resting. So he includes, nor thy ox, nor thine ass, nor thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates. Sabbath only applied to the strangers who lived in Israel. That thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. And remember that thou wast a servant, God's telling them why, in the land of Egypt. And that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commandeth thee to keep the Sabbath day. It's specifically related to the formation of Israel into a nation, a national entity. Before that, they were descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
They were a people group. They lived in Egypt. But they weren't a distinct nation. They were slaves. And God made them into a distinct nation when they crossed the Red Sea and he took them to Sinai and gave them the law. He tells us that it only relates to Israel in Exodus chapter 31. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel. We're talking here. Moses speaking to the Jews, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, plural, not merely the weekly Sabbath, for it is a sign between me and you, that is, between God and the children of Israel throughout your generations. And he gives them a reason for it, that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Verse 14, ye shall keep the Sabbaths, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Listen to the penalty for breaking the Sabbath. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Now listen carefully to this. Don't hear what I'm not saying. If Sunday is now the Sabbath, and the church is now Israel, which much of Reformed theology teaches, if Sunday is now the Sabbath, and if the church is now Israel, any Christian who works on Sunday has incurred the death penalty. For centuries before Christ, only Jews, the covenant people, and those living among the Jews who knew the law, and we saw that already, the stranger that doth dwell within thy gates, only those people incurred the death penalty for breaking the Sabbath. God never placed it on any other Gentile nation in all the world around during that period of time. If the Sabbath law now applies to the church, the death penalty also still applies because death was the divinely mandated punishment for breaking the Sabbath. You cannot pick and choose which portions of Sabbath law you think ought to apply. If the weekly Sabbath applies, so do all of the high holy days. When was the last time you kept Shavuot? When was the last time you kept Yom Kippur? When was the last time you kept the Feast of the Trumpets? Those are all Sabbaths, according to the Old Testament scripture. They're all called Sabbaths. That's why it's stated as, you are going to keep my Sabbaths, otherwise you're going to die. You can't pick and choose. James says it well in James 2.10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. Dear friends, the reason we do what we do is not because we are under the law. The only one who could ever keep the law perfectly was Jesus. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The law only condemns us. Don't try to pick and choose and say, well, now Sunday is the Sabbath and the church is Israel, and therefore, because the church is Israel, we have to keep the Sabbath laws. If you do, you've got to keep them all. If you do, you've got to keep all the rest of the law, too. If you do, you've got to keep the dietary laws. God is making a change in Acts 10. That's the point of the passage. I had an elderly gentleman in the church in North Jersey that I served many years ago that uh, did what the Orthodox Jews do today, trying to extend the Sabbath laws to anything that caused sweat. When you work, you sweat. So therefore, when you sweat, you must be working. He had a special vendetta against baseball on Sunday because the players must therefore be breaking the Sabbath. They sweated. By that reasoning, it's harder to keep the Sabbath in a hot climate than it is in a cold climate. The Orthodox Jews today, and you've heard me say this before, wear sneakers on the Sabbath, that is on Saturday, so that they won't strike a flint with a nail in the shoe, lighting a fire, and thus break the Sabbath. 
Folks, you miss the grace of God when you think that way. Let me keep reading on. Exodus 31, verses 15 and following. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is a Sabbath of rest. Not the first, the seventh. Holy to the Lord, whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Verse 16. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations, for a perpetual covenant. This is the sign of the covenant that God made with national Israel. It is a sign, verse 17, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. That's the original giving of the law. Those are the tables that Moses had in his arms as he's coming down from the mountain. And when he sees and hears what's going on, he smashes them. Because the children of Israel have already broken everything that God said. Ezekiel 20. It's repeated again. Verse 10 through 12. Wherefore I caused them to go forth out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness... And I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. <laughs> we know now a man cannot do it and live in it, for we're all guilty. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify them. He says it again in verse 20, that it's a, a covenant between God and Israel. And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Ezekiel is writing to Jews. You can't miss that when you read the book of Ezekiel. The Ten Commandments were given to Jews. The Gentiles were excluded. They were on the outside. Now God, here in Acts chapter 10, is moving away from the old system. Oh, he still has moral standards, and those are repeated, but on a new basis. In fact, the new basis even goes further. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing that is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. It doesn't just say don't steal. Let him that stole steal no more. But it says, I got another one for you, but rather let him labor with his hands. You've got to work. You can't be a bum. Labor with his hands. And there's a reason for it, not just so you can amass wealth for yourself, that he may have to give to him that needeth. You see, if you want to think about the law, think about the restatements in the New Testament, every one of which goes farther than the Old Testament law ever did, but it's on a new basis. It's with a new empowerment. It's because of a new relationship that we have with Christ. It's because the grace of God motivates you far more powerfully than the law ever could. Your love for Christ makes you want to do more than is required. Dear people, that's an essential difference. If you don't understand that difference, you don't understand the difference between law and grace. If you don't understand that difference, you don't understand the difference between Israel and the church. If you don't understand that difference, your entire life is based on sweat and toil over here instead of resting in Jesus. Main theme of the book of Galatians, main theme of the book of Colossians, main theme of the book of Ephesians, main theme of the book of Romans. You won't understand any of the major epistles of the New Testament unless you understand that distinction. Let me put it this way, as God was making his covenant with Israel, the, the Sabbath was like a wedding ring between God and national Israel. And he told them, keep wearing that ring, because that's what shows that you are the nation I have chosen out from all the nations of the world. I'm not married to any of the other ones. It's just you and me. 
And that's why he is so angry at Israel when they fornicate with the pagan gods around. Because they're his. That's what the book of Hosea is all about. Well, I've gotten a little farther afield than I had planned to do tonight. But let me just point this out again in the New Testament. As we see later in the New Testament, God didn't just change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. He abolished the Sabbath laws. And that's been difficult for even some of the Gentiles in the church to swallow. The Sabbath is not the only part of the Ten, is the only part of the Ten Commandments that is not restated in the New Testament. All the rest is moral law, but the Sabbath, that is Saturday, not Sunday, related to national Israel. Paul talks about that abolishing in several books in the New Testament, relating to the law and how it is not any longer the standard for the Christian, but Jesus is our standard. How it's not any longer the motivating factor for the Christian, but the love of Christ is. Let me read you just a couple of verses. 2 Corinthians 3.13 And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Ephesians 2.15 Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, that is, of Jews and Gentiles, one new man, so making peace. You'll never understand our position on a co-equal basis with the Jews unless you understand this principle. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 and following. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. He's not writing to a bunch of Jews in a synagogue at Colossae. He's talking to them about the fact that you were clearly Gentiles. The uncircumcision of your flesh, that's certainly Gentiles, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. See, the law condemned you. What did Jesus do with the handwriting of ordinances that was against you that condemned you? He nailed it to his cross. You see, the accusation was written over that was on his cross that said, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. That's what they did with criminals. They nailed the accusations against them to the cross of the criminal. You heard me preach a message on this in a preparatory service several months ago. They nailed it to the cross. Jesus took everything in the law that condemned us. And he took it on himself and nailed it to his cross. He fulfilled the law. He kept it perfectly. So that now when you trust in Jesus Christ, you are in Christ. And the handwriting of ordinances that was against you was nailed to his cross. He took it out of the way. He abolished it. It's no longer your sentence of death. You are now a new creature in Christ, if you have truly trusted him. You are now one upon whom the Holy Spirit is working to transform you into the image of Christ and his glory. Took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it, now listen to verse 16. Directly on target. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink. That was the problem Peter was having in Acts chapter 10. I can't eat that stuff. The law said I couldn't eat it. Or in respect of an holy day, Yom Kippur, Feast of Tabernacles, Passover, Pentecost, Feast of Booths, you know, or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, special holidays for the Jews on the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, the plural, includes all the Sabbaths of the Old Testament, which are a shadow 
of things to come. But the body is of Christ. All of the Sabbaths and all of the dietary laws and all of these things that are suddenly crumbling before Peter's eyes in Acts chapter 10 with Gentiles coming to the house and then with Peter not only going with the Gentiles but he's going to go into their house and he's going to eat with them and he's going to get called on the carpet for it in Acts chapter 15. God is working in Peter's heart. I hope you understand how God should be working in our hearts too to understand the different basis upon why we do what we do. Not because of the law, but because of the grace of God shown to us in Christ. And to abuse grace is always worse than abusing law. Of how much sorer punishment shall he be thought worthy who have trampled under feet the Son of God and despised the blood of the covenant and done despite under the spirit of grace. How much sorer punishment than even the punishment given at Mount Sinai for stoning an animal that touched the mountain. That's Hebrews, written to Jews who were still stuck on the law. How much sorer punishment shall he be thought worthy of receiving who has despised the grace of God? Because you see, you and I have a much greater empowerment. We have the permanently indwelling Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit whom God hath given to them that, what? Obey Him. Learning to obey immediately. Learning to do what God has told us immediately, not because there's the threat of the law, but because our relationship with Christ is so much different. And our love for Him should be too. All the Sabbaths were foreshadowing of Christ who now personally is our rest. Therefore, like the sacrifices are done away and the dietary laws are done away, even the Sabbath laws have been done away. And Colossians was certainly written to Gentiles, which is what we are. And one of the key themes of that book is not to be spiritually seduced back under the law and the ordinances. Major theme of Galatians, as we said a moment ago. Now somebody's going to say, aha, that means I don't have to go to church. That means I can cut out. And there's no problem because I'm not under the law. You're right, you're not under the law. The law never said you had to go to church. Did you know that? <laughs> no place in the Old Testament do you ever find the law saying, you've got to go to church. Every week, got to show up on Sunday. The law never said it. Being out from under the law doesn't change whatever relates to Sunday. Because... The Sabbath is Saturday. The law only required adult males to show up at Jerusalem three times a year at the temple. The synagogue was post-exilic after the exile. It wasn't something that God had commanded. Well, they showed up there sort of as a community center and they did worship and they read the prophets and so on just so they wouldn't forget, but that's not going to church, folks. Why are you not free, if we're not under the law, why are you not free to just skip church? Because, after all, that's a fun thing to do, you know, sit home and watch TV or uh, sleep in late, or maybe if you want to earn a few extra bucks, you go out and, you know, work someplace. Why are you not free to do that? Because there's a New Testament command related to worshiping. No question that the believers worshipped on the first day of the week, not because of the law, but because of the resurrection of Christ. But listen to what Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 says to us. This is clearly written to people who were using that as an excuse for what we might call cutting out of church. Hebrews chapter 10. Starting at verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. You're professing your faith. You're telling other people about Jesus. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. The Old Testament required some good works, but the reason we do it is not because of that. But we are to provoke one another to love and to good works. Works will always extend from love. Now look at verse 25. Not forsake, 
forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. See, there were Jews at Jerusalem. The book of Hebrews is written to the Jews at Jerusalem shortly before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Already there were those who had put two and two together, they thought, they weren't paying attention to the details. But they said, man, if we're no longer under the Sabbath laws, hey, we're free from having to do anything. We wipe our hands clean of it. We don't have to show up for church. We don't have to get together with other believers. Hey, when you do, you know, obedience to divine commands uh, might be costly to us, and we don't want to be identified really very openly with those believers. We just want to sort of sneak around. And that way, when they miss us, they'll just think, oh, well, he must have run into trouble today. When actually we're sitting here, you know, playing our dice games. Not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Do you fit the category? Are you a, yeah, Sunday morning is good enough for me. I know I'm preaching Sunday evening. But um, there are sure a lot less people here tonight than there were this morning. It doesn't say not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together on Sunday mornings. It sort of implies that when the church assembles, the believers should be there. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. We get into habits, don't we? But exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. For the Jewish believers in Jerusalem, that day approaching was a fearful and scary day and he goes on and he talks about that a little bit later it's a fearful and scary day approaching Jerusalem was going to be destroyed there was a, a severe persecution of the church in Jerusalem going on and they were exhorted to exhort one another for faithful attendance and fellowship and worship as they saw the day approaching. And now notice the next verse. Many times folks leave the next verse out, but it's the context. For if we sin willfully, what's he been talking about? People who have gotten into the habit of skipping church. For if we sin willfully, you know what you're supposed to do, but you don't do it because you've got a good excuse. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. And that's the verses next that I quoted to you a few moments ago. Listen. He that despised Moses' law. So he's telling him, you're not under Moses' law. You're under something different. But you should be showing up for church when the group is assembled together. You ought to be there. That wasn't commanded in the Old Testament. God changed some things. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. What happened to people who broke the Sabbath? They were stoned to death. Of how much... Now, what can you think of that's worse than that? Of how much sorer punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. Let me pause for a moment. Is that the Mosaic covenant or is that the new covenant made through the blood of Christ? He's setting a contrast with the covenant God made at Mount Sinai with the nation Israel with a different covenant. 
a covenant that's a gracious covenant. It's a covenant also cut in blood. It's a covenant made with the blood of Jesus. Counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite or despite unto the Spirit of grace. Of grace. God hath given his Holy Spirit unto them that obey him, and they were cut to the heart and took counsel how they might slay them. Dear people, it's not a popular thought. This obedience, this submission to God and what are the details that he's given us and what does he want us to obey and what are we no longer under and we focus on all the things that we are no longer under and think that we're keeping them while we ignore parts of it like the Sabbath law or the dietary laws. Either you're under it or you're not. You see, Peter is been very obedient under the law. But God is trying to expand and will expand Peter's thinking to see that God is doing something new. God is doing something different. God is making changes that have never been made before. God is bringing Gentiles in. God is turning everything that Peter has lived for upside down. God is going to show grace to Gentiles. That's us. Oh, we can go on in that passage, but I just give it to you by way of illustration. How serious this issue is. God prepared Peter. He made him hungry. God told him three times. Peter needed to pay attention. Later, Peter falls back into his old ways and has to be rebuked. We see that in Galatians 2 where Paul rebukes Peter because Peter goes back to trying to live like a Jew because he's afraid of what the people from Jerusalem are going to say about him. We read in closing last week a very important set of verses. He tells us about the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And one of them is commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Peter sees a sheet, and then it says, Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made enquiry for si in Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. Verse 19. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down and go with them. <laughs> Doubting Nothing, for I have sent them. God makes it very clear to Peter. Peter had argued with the Lord when the sheet was let down out of heaven. Sheet is withdrawn into heaven. Peter has never gotten up and killed anything or eaten anything out of that sheet. No bats, no moles, no cockroaches. You know, he didn't kill anything in that sheet. Didn't cook himself a lobster, didn't cook himself some shrimp. He wouldn't eat anything in the sheet. And God pulls it back to heaven. Peter's sitting there scratching his head and he's doubting. Well, now Peter doubted in himself what the vision which he had seen should mean. He knew God was trying to tell him a lesson, but he had no idea what it was. <laughs> Have you ever been in a state like that? You knew God was trying to teach you something. You'd just been through an experience or you just read a passage of scripture and you thought, what in the world does that mean? How does this apply to me? What, Lord, am I supposed to do now? You're at a crossroads in your life, and it looks like either all the doors are open or all the doors are closed. And there's no place to go, nothing to do. You don't know what God's will is. Now, while Peter doubted, God gives specific direction in those times of doubt. And you know, this was not the first time that Peter had doubted. Do you remember back in Mark chapter 16, the last few verses 
of that chapter, Jesus is risen. The witnesses have come and told the disciples. And it tells us that when they heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, that is Mary Magdalene, believed not. Afterward, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country, and they went and told it to the residue. Neither believed they them. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of tart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. This is a normal human condition. This is the kind of thing that you and I go through. We don't believe. We doubt. We question. You've seen the bumper sticker, Question Authority. Dear friends, that's rebellion. We're talking tonight about obedience to authority. About the authority can change the command in the middle of the road if it wants to. I can remember multiple times when I told my children to do something and they started doing it. And then I told them, stop what you're doing and go do this. And they said to me, but you told us to do this. <laughs> the one in authority has the right to change his command even while you're doing it and tell you to do something else. How hard it is for us to learn that. God is never whimsical or arbitrary when he changes commands that he has given. Never. Human beings are. Sometimes husbands love to torment their wives that way. Some sadistic parents torment their children that way. Sometimes government officials torment the citizenry that way. There are some churches where pastors and elders and deacons torment their congregations that way. God never does. God always does it for a specific purpose and for a specific reason. Romans 6, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. The commands that God gives to us are designed to produce the peaceable fruit of righteousness. The discipline that God brings us is to cause us to obey his commands. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. How's your thought life? What do you think about while you're driving down the highway? What do you think about as you're lying in bed and you haven't quite gotten to sleep yet and you've given up on the old idea of counting sheep? Although oftentimes I count the sheep here and pray for them. What's running through your mind? What do you look at that brings wrong thoughts into your mind? What do you view on TV? What kind of DVDs do you check out? What kind of thoughts do you have as you walk, watch certain people scantily clothed walking down the street? Bringing into captivity every thought to what? The obedience of Christ. Not to the obedience of the law, to the obedience of Christ. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you, ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel, when truly believed, results in obedience. Being made perfect, he, speaking of Jesus, became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. You don't obey to get saved, but it results from your salvation. 
Immediate obedience. Learning to obey immediately. Peter has seen the vision. He's doubting in himself. Suddenly three men show up at the door downstairs. Peter is called downstairs. The Holy Spirit tells him, go. I have sent them. And suddenly Peter gets it. He understands why God talked about dietary laws. Because Peter had always obeyed the dietary laws and strictly had obeyed the laws related to separation from Gentiles. Now God says, Peter, you just learned a little lesson. I'm going to bring you to the big lesson now. Oh, that we might learn to obey immediately as Peter does in our passage tonight. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the magnificence of the gospel of Christ. The awesome magnitude of the grace of God. The liberating freedom that we have, not so that we can sin, but so that we have power not to sin. How we thank you, Father, for being motivated by love for Christ. Instead of trembling in fear before the law. How we thank you for new life that we have in Christ, not the death that the law always brought. How we thank you, Father, because one Gentile man obeyed and one Jewish man obeyed and there was an intersection in their lives that we have the door opened for us and the freedom that is ours in Christ. Help us, Father, to use that freedom wisely and cause us to learn to obey. For it is the reflection of our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.